Hello and welcome to Sales 3.0 and my presentation on how coaching can help elevate sales performance. We're going to have some fun with this one, folks. I actually do have a plan. For those of you who know me, you're probably laughing now. Right, we're going to start by talking about some foundations. First of all, why even coach? Right? What's the uh, what's the what's the benefit, and what exactly is coaching? We'll get on the the same page. You get some alignment around what coaching is all about. Then we want to get into some how-to stuff. We'll talk about a situation assessment. You know, something not many people talk about with coaching. And I think it's a critically important element to help you get better results from it. We'll talk about solution design. What's that weird thing? Um, and then masterful execution, right? And I'll share with you a sales coaching framework and a process talk about conducting field training as part of coaching because sometimes it's necessary, how to actually run the sales coaching sessions, and then creating a coaching culture and a cadence in your organization. Now, today, folks, this is going to be a high-level, quick-paced overview. You absolutely will get the slides. And note that there is an appendix in this deck that you'll get with a link to an ebook with even more detail behind some of this coaching that stuff that we'll talk about. And of course, that'll act as a good summary as well. If you have other questions, you want to chat, please visit our booth here uh, or even reach out to me after the fact. So that's our plan for today. Let's get rolling. Why should we coach? You know, I, I think the value of coaching is relatively clear in people that I talk to, but I did put some data points together that support its power. If you look at this chart on the right, right, with a formalized coaching approach, as opposed to coaching just being left up to managers loosey-goosey or informal coaching, formal coaching and dynamic coaching or adaptive coaching radically improve win rates in the organization, right? 11.5% uh, for formalized coaching, dramatic coaching, or dynamic uh, coaching approach, uh, or adaptive, as I call it, improves win rates by 28%. Um, and that source was from CSO Insights. The approach that you're going to hear about today is the dynamic or adaptive approach. In another study, right, you can see that um, sales training improved productivity by 22.4%, which is pretty impressive on its own. But the follow-up coaching increased productivity by a walloping 88%, right? And there's some other data points there. But I wanted to share um, two stories with you, right, in addition to this massive case here about the 88% improvement, about two case studies that are actually a result of this exact coaching method that I'm going to share with you today. Case one was a B2B tech sales company, and they did an implementation company-wide. The managers finished their training in late Q1, and then by year end, this company had a revenue lift of more than 34%. And it was the first time in a while they finished the year over quota. They also uh, had some other interesting things they reported to me, a decrease in rep turnover and faster ramp up times for new sales hires who were being coached differently along the journey. Case number two was uh, in a, an injection molding company, um, and they wanted to do a division pilot rather than do a company-wide rollout to, be to begin. And in four months, the, the chosen manager's division performance improved by 36% over his previous quarter, and he led the country at that point in improvement. His team improved profitability by 11%, which was something that was an important target for him and his territory, and they had a greatly improved win rate. After that pilot, they did a company-wide implementation, and they surpassed their annual quota that year by 16%, and that was the best company performance they had seen in four years. So coaching absolutely does produce great results. Now, what exactly is it? Because we toss this term around, but if you talk to 25 people, you'll probably get at least 10 or 15 different definitions of what coaching is. So we define sales coaching as a formal development process where sales managers partner with their sales reps to improve sales performance. You're going to hear this come up again and again in this presentation with this methodology. It's a partnering process. It's a journey 
that reps and managers go through together. So what exactly is a sales coach then? Well, a sales coach is someone who identifies performance gaps, wins commitment to learning and improving from their reps, arranges practice sessions with feedback loops, what a concept, practice, fosters continual application of what they learn in reflection, thinking back about performance to lift competence, achieve greater results, and improve work performance. A sales coach also facilitates, leads, empowers, inspires, enables, and acts as a guide or a Sherpa, like the picture to the right. This is very different than what many sales managers are doing today, uh, which is firing off quick feedback to people uh, in between things that they're, they already are doing, right? As part of this process, though, that feedback I mentioned is also important. So directive feedback or training, which is a more directive uh, improvement methodology, may also be needed and should be incorporated into what a sales coach does, right? So that's coaching and what a coach is, but training, how does that fit into coaching, right? And so sales coaches actually do both. If you think about it, it's skill development and it's behavioral coaching, and it addresses the, the questions that you see here. Does your rep know what to do, why to do it, and how much or how often to do something? Can they do it? Meaning, do they know how and do they have the skill to actually do it? And then in the real world, will they do it? And are they doing enough of it or well enough? The first half of this in the darker blue, do they know what, why, and how much or how often to do something? And to a certain degree, do they know how to do it? That's all field training. What, why, and how is always teaching someone how to do something. Now, beyond that, when you start to, to switch over from, do they know how to do it? Do they actually have the skill to do it? You're starting to move now into sales coaching, right? Will they do it? Or are they doing enough of it or well enough? We're on the lighter blue or bottom half of the field training sales coaching bar there. There is a dovetail or a crossover point at this skill level. And the training is focused on how to do something the coaching is focused on how to do it better. And I've seen this have an impact on managers when they have this aha moment, they can start thinking more clearly. And we'll see this in a minute about whether their rep needs training to get better at something or whether they need coaching to help them do that something even better. The definition will matter. And so I've mentioned feedback. What about feedback? How does that fit in? Well, if we're defining coaching as this formal development process where there's, you know, diagnosis and planning and executing those plans, reviewing performance, it's really an engaging process with the reps, the, the managers acting as a guide or a Sherpa, but yet we know that sometimes more directive methods are needed. Feedback is one of those directive methods. Feedback is your advice, right? It's often corrective or evaluative. It's focused very often on something that just happened right now or, or previous behavior. And very often it's, it's directive. It's telling someone as opposed to questioning or guiding them. Right, one of the biggest dividing lines here. Now, look, feedback does help employees understand what's preventing them from reaching their current goals or what specifically to do differently, right? And providing feedback can be part of this coaching process. So it is highly valuable. But what I most often see is managers are firing off feedback constantly, but it's not part of a coaching process. It is their coaching process. And that's what we want to get away from. So let's talk then about how do we coach and how do we conduct a situation assessment? What does this crazy guy mean by that? Let's start by thinking about it in two ways. First of all, you most likely have a CRM and you most likely have reports. There are some level of sales analytics or metrics in your organization, whether it's CRM or ERP or dashboards, reports, you're looking at lagging and leading indicators and your KPIs, all your sales metrics. All right. And there are things I, I can't get into today based on time, but we have an ebook on this and I'd be happy to talk with anyone who wants to chat about it. But there's a report that I very often develop for organizations that compares their sales process 
uh, metrics, you know, how many opportunities are in the pipeline at each stage, the conversion ratios between those stages, and build a report to compare your rep against the average of top producers, the average for the organization for the middle producers, and then as a sales manager, that whole team average, and then each individual rep listed under that. Well, when you look up and down the rows of the sales process, right, or those columns rather, and you look at the conversion ratios between stages, if you have a rep that has a 20% conversion ratio between stage one and stage two, and the average in the organization is 32, and top producers have a 36%, you know that that's an area that if you focus there, and you change that number and help them get better at converting between stage one and stage two, you can radically change their performance. And then imagine doing that across an entire team with that kind of targeted approach. And that's this situation assessment. Another piece of that is what I call ROAM, and that's results versus objectives, activities, and methodology. The results are really the end outcome, right? It's the actual result that you get. The objectives right, or the preset goal, quota, or target, or the forecast, right? So you have a forecast result, you have an actual result. Obviously, if there's a difference between those and the objective is higher than the end result, you have an area that you're starting to be able to target, hey, I want to go take a look at this particular area. When you're looking in that area, get managers to focus on the activities. What is the rep doing with whom how often, possibly even when and where, if that matters in the activity they're performing. If you do that, you start to assess, are they doing the right type of activities with the right buyers at the right time and enough of it? If that doesn't fix the problem, if the problem isn't that, right, then you have to look deeper at the methodology. And the methodology is really in, in any process, right, there's in each stage has objectives, tasks, and exit criteria. Well, the tasks are what the rep is doing in that stage in the buyer facing selling tasks are the sales methodology. And this is basically the quality of what they're doing. If they're calling the prospect, and they're doing enough of it with the right buyers at the right times in the right in the right way, but their execution is poor. Then you have to focus on quality. So starts with activities, moves to methodology, right? And based on those kind of assessments, you can really start to to target and hone down where you want to spend time with your reps to get better results. Very often, what I hear from managers is, "Hey, Bob, I'm available next Tuesday." You know, what can I listen to? What calls do you have going on that I can listen in? What you want managers to say is, hey, Bob, I'd like to work with you when you're in stage two with a client moving towards stage three. When can I ride along or arrange to listen in on a call like that? Or if you're doing conversation intelligence and call recordings, what calls can I listen to where you were recently in stage two moving towards stage three? That's where we want managers to get. Then it's about, How do you coach and can you design the right solutions? Let's look at that. For solution design, there are really two things to think about. There's the solution type. Is this training, coaching, something else? There's the solution content. What content and best practice content is going to close the gap between what I'm seeing from my rep and what I need to see, right? And for solution type, I've adapted This chart from the work of a man named Ferdinand Fornes wrote the book with the longest title in the world, I think, uh, Why Employees Don't Do What They're Supposed to Do and What to Do About It. There's a link uh, to to Ferdinand Fornes' books at the bottom there. Give him full credit for the concept, although we have adapted this. If you look at the conditions on the left, they don't know something. They've got some incorrect thinking or mindset gaps. There are misaligned consequences, and there are some real constraints, right? Well, Oops, sorry. So if you look at the top, the training coach, the reasons, right, are the don't know something. They don't know what to do. They don't know why to do something. They don't know how to do it. The solutions to those things are training first, then coaching, especially coaching for how, because we know that coaching applies to when you want something done better. If you look at the incorrect thinking, right? Their way is better. Your way won't work. Something else is more important. They think they are doing it, which would be a lack of feedback, right? To to address those, some of those might require counseling, 
what coaching is appropriate for the things you want them to do better. Those are the only two things. Those top bars are the only ones that training or coaching is the right solution. So this is an important chart from two perspectives. First of all, do I need to train or do I need to coach? And secondly, when will training or coaching not solve the problem? If it's misaligned consequences or real constraints, you can train and coach all day long and you're not going to improve their performance based on the training and coaching. That's an important distinction. Secondly is the solution content, right? So where does this content come from in your company, right? It could be known best practices in your industry. I used a prospect example earlier, right? If you're prospecting for this product set to this kind of customer base, what's the most effective methodology that works. It might be from the top producer practices that you've gathered in your company where you've crowdsourced them together. It might be from your company's excellent training programs. It might be from an approved external resource like Sparks IQ. It might be from your own experience and expertise because as a sales manager, obviously uh, you were promoted for a reason and generally uh, it has something to do with you getting good results, right? So it might be something that you know that they could do more effectively. It might be your rep's own ideas to try. And look, whether they you think they will work or not, um, unless you think it's going to be a complete train wreck, it, it can you can really gain some buy-in right from your reps by getting them involved, engaging them, having helped them build the solutions, right? Because they come with certain expertise and and, uh, and and knowledge as well. It could be from the A players on your team, and you get people engaged in peer coaching and and, and sharing their best practices. And surprisingly, right, we often don't think about this. It could be from a B or C player generally who just happens to excel at X, with X being exactly what your employee needs to get better at. So it doesn't matter where it comes from, but it needs to come from somewhere. Right? And if your company isn't starting to catalog and, and codify best practices for every stage of the sales process or across the entire customer life cycle, you absolutely should be doing that, right? But that's where the solution content comes from. So solution type, Will training or coaching in which one solve the performance problem at hand? Or is it something else and I shouldn't train or coach? Solution content, where's this great idea coming from that will help my employee close the gap and get better at what they want to do? Now let's talk about putting all that together in the masterful execution of how to coach. There's a four-part plan for this. Part one is the sales coaching framework and a coaching process. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Then it's when it's necessary, when the employee doesn't know what, why, or how to do something, like we talked about with the Ferdinand Forney's adapted chart, you might need to do some field training first. Then there's how do you conduct the sales coaching when coaching is appropriate. And then there's how are you going to get this to stick in my organization? How am I going to create a coaching culture and a cadence of coaching. So let's take a look at each one of these. Let's talk first about the sales coaching framework and process. There are some inputs into this, right? You have to have some sense of the, the sales competencies that are required for your account executives or account managers or sellers, sales engineers, whatever it is. By role, what are the competencies that are necessary to be successful? And do they know them? Do they have them? There's some level usually of competency diagnostics, whether it's an assessment, a talent assessment like uh, that we do at Sparks IQ, whether it's um, a, a survey that the reps take and they rate themselves and then their managers rate them and you compare those two and that starts a good coaching conversation. Uh, whether you're looking at your reports and your Rome analysis from earlier, right? You have to have the competencies, know the competencies, somehow be able to diagnose how well is your rep doing toward them. And if your manager and reps do this together, it's even better. And that's why the next step right after inputs is people. They, these people, these inputs feed into the people, the rep and the manager, with the rep being on top here, because I believe the rep needs to own their own development. The manager if they're that guide or a Sherpa, will support them through this journey. 
Now, I will step back and say, when you're implementing this, it rarely works that way at first. You've got to get through this a few cycles before first the rep really starts to trust the process and trust that what they share won't be used against them in a court of law, right? But when you get past that point, when you get through this cycle a few times and the rep truly feels the manager's support in helping them improve and get better, they really start to like pick up in this process, take ownership, and really start to uh, to throw themselves into it. And I've seen that happen in in a dozen organizations time and time again going through this process. Then there's the coaching process. Now, it's going to look a little different here in terms of visual than you'll see it in a minute, but it's the same process. You do something using those competencies and inputs to diagnose the performance issue with the rep, just like we've been talking about. Then you start to work with the rep to create a plan. And there's some outputs to that, as you see on the bottom. It could be a personalized learning plan and a path that they follow. That learning plan could involve um, reading, taking courses, uh, talking to peers or mentors inside the organization. Could be a job aid or something that might help them. Could be dozens of things as part of their personalized learning journey. But there also is likely an output of some field training, some sales coaching, and some action plans that you and the rep as the manager would develop together. All right, so those are the outputs of the planning stage. Next is this do and review cycle. So the process is diagnose, plan, do, review. Do and review will cycle back and forth where the rep goes and, and puts that plan into place, especially the action plan after the field training or sales coaching. And the manager reviews that, does another Rome analysis or check, looks at the numbers to see if they're getting better, validates the, the rep is doing what they said they were going to do. And you cycle back around between those two until you get the results that you want. All right. So that's the coaching process. When you hit that end result, the next most important thing you do is go right back to the beginning and start over again. We'll come back to uh, to that piece of it, but that's the sales coaching framework with the coaching process. Now, how does field training fit into this? Well, we said from the Forney's chart that if the rep doesn't know what to do, why to do it, or how to do it, right, training happens first. Um, and that's what this would be all about, right? So training is an appropriate solution when they don't know what, why, or how to do something. And look, there are ways that you can facilitate somewhat with training and pull out of people the knowledge that they already have. But this is the time when being directive is okay. You're showing them what to do. You're telling them why to do it. And you're helping them understand how to do it and, and get to that basic level of of, uh, of understanding and of skill development. Now, how do you do it? Folks, I'll tell you that this model looks incredibly simple and we've probably all heard the words tell, show, do before. I've added the review here for the cycle. All right, it happens in that order, one, two, three, four, tell, show, do, review. There is a secret in this though, and it's that little thing that looks like a home plate with a check mark. That's the understanding check. And here's how this works. I'm a sales manager. I'm telling the rep what to do. And again, I'm doing that because it's training on what, why, and how to do something. At the end of that tell session, before we move on, I need that rep to summarize our conversation back to me. And I don't leave this stage until the rep can do it to my satisfaction. That's critically important. Then you move to show and you do the same thing. I role play it with them. They role play it back. There might be some feedback loops in that. And we don't leave that stage until they can show me they can actually do it. Then we put the action plan together. They go out and they, they do this in the real world. Hopefully I'm going along at some point to observe or write along, call along, listen to recordings, and we get back together and we review how it's going. And maybe there's a chance for additional feedback or practice, right? But you've now gone through a field training loop that with the understanding checks is an excuse remover extraordinaire. If they can tell you exactly what you want them to do, if they can show you that they can do it, then if they're not actually doing it, it's probably a different problem or you have some mindset and fear things to overcome, right? But it's a great excuse remover because they can't say, well, I didn't know that's what you meant, right? So that's the field training model. 
for coaching, right? Now we're talking about the top two boxes. Once they know what, why, and how to do something and need to do it better, you coach in that box. And, you know, for some of the things in the second box with incorrect thinking, right, maybe they need better feedback and create an openness to coaching because they think they're doing it, but they're not. Um, you know, maybe they think something else is more important and you can help them uh, see, you know, why it's so important. If their way is better, your way won't work. That might move more into a counseling thing. But there are definitely some things in here that you can coach. We've already talked about the coaching process being diagnose, plan, do, review, right? Same thing, though, with the understanding checks. You diagnose together, and I've seen some managers send their reps uh, the reports and have them say, we're going to meet next week. I want you to come prepared to tell me what your diagnosis is. And then manager comes prepared to discuss that. And then they create a plan together. Rep goes out and does it, and manager uh, meets again to review. Now, there's a difference, though, between this coaching process and actually leading the coaching sessions, right? And, uh, you know, I have an acronym for this called SLED, right? It set the stage. You lead the performance discussion, explore solution options, and agree on the best solution, then develop and implement an action plan. So in setting the stage, it's really just kind of the way you would with any great meeting because you and your reps, you all run great meetings, right? You have a, a purpose, you have outcomes, you have a process, and you set and you, you, you make sure that your rep understands your intentions with this particular meeting, how long you're going to be together, what you're going to be together, the outcomes you're going to get, and set the stage for how it's all going to go. Then you have that performance discussion where you start to get into diagnose. You agree on solutions and the best one and create that plan so they can go forth and do. And, you know, you might sled uh, in various stages, right? Sometimes you'll do more than one meeting. You'll do SNL of sled and diagnose, and then you'll meet later to do the ED of, um, of sled in plan. Or you might uh, meet in, in in review where you do the entire thing all at once as you prepare to go back around the cycle. And, you know, once you're reviewing, you know that you go back and forth between do and review, right? So SLED, the, the how to run the session in a meeting may actually pop up at various places in the process. Hopefully that makes sense. So last thing then is this coaching culture. How do you do that? Well, We've already talked about the sales coaching framework with the coaching process. And the part of this that really starts to get into creating the culture and the cadence is when you see the results on the right, that arrow that leads you right back to the very beginning where you start over. Now, when I worked for GE Capital, we did this on a six-month basis. So biannually, right, we would look at the inputs. The rep and manager would get together. They would go through the process. They'd put plans in place. They were learning plans. And however, the manager was going to support them with training and coaching and create action plans. They'd get the results. And then they'd loop back around to the beginning in the next six months and do it again. I have actually seen some companies do this quarterly, right? That tends to be a little intense for some, but uh, it can produce great results if the action plans can actually be implemented, if the skill levels you want the rep to get to can be accomplished in a quarter, then by all means, do it as often as you possibly can. Some of it might depend upon your span of control as well. But in general, just think that that loop back to the beginning starts to get you into a pattern and a cadence. So. That's it for the, the actual uh, presentation materials, but I do have an appendix here for you in addition to the slides themselves. There's some great propaganda about me. Thank you, Mom. Right, But the most important thing is on the bottom, there are some ways that you can connect with me and follow my content. The content that's published there is all free and for the taking. Right, So uh, no cost, and uh, the, for the majority of it, it's not gated. A webinar, obviously, you have to sign up for the webinars at SMM Connect. Uh, but LinkedIn articles, all the stuff I publish on LinkedIn, the stuff on our blog, right, at Sparks IQ, uh, feel free to grab anything and use it. Um, we do a lot of, uh, of um, sales effectiveness improvement work at Sparks IQ. You can certainly check us out. But I wanted to get to this to show you that for sales coaching excellence, right, 
um, we have an ebook, The Path to a Best in Class Salesforce. You can download it right at the link that you see here. And uh, I think that uh, it will not only give you a reminder about some of these things, but uh, it even goes into a little bit more detail than what we talked about here today, sort of rapid fire in 30 minutes. There's also additional materials that uh, are free for you and might be helpful. Uh, so at Sparks IQ, we have an entire landing page dedicated to thought leadership. It's sales coaching excellence is there. Uh, there's uh, the sales training uh, system with the five stages of sales mastery and behavior change can be downloaded. We have an ebook on how to hire sales pros that will deliver results. Everything here is free and and I hope they uh, I, I hope it helps. So I wasn't sure if we'd have much time for questions. We actually do have um, a few minutes left. Um, Amanda, if you're uh, you're here and uh, and anything has come in, um, do we have questions from the audience or should we? Uh, set them free to um, mull about. Hello, Amanda. No questions, Amanda says. So I want to uh, thank you for being here. Check out the ebook. Come see us at the booth and enjoy the conference. I appreciate you being here and I hope this content will be helpful for you. Thank you very much.